Great. So really glad we found the time to have this conversation because um, as I've learned now from, from your email about your work, um, you really have been engaged in doing the kind of research that had I been able to do a PhD research in the last few years, that's exactly what I would have researched. So, oh, really? Wow. It's, it's really interesting. I'm, I'm fascinated to, to hear what, what you've um, discovered on that journey. And for me, that whole conversation about regenerative cultures or, or where we're at as a humanity at this point has so much to do with bioregions. It's, it's literally about how do we re-inhabit planet Earth as one species among many, as a keystone species that has the capacity to bring ecosystems into abundance and increased bioproductivity and, and, and diversity and flourishing mm -hmm. as, as we have proven for the long journey of, of our species um, when we were still expressions of place coming out of the bioregions. And now we either find a new way of doing that, and that means coming to grips with to what extent we use technology and to what extent the current technology use is feasible, and um, I think we need to also, because we're now committed, we're in the age of consequences um, with regard to climate change, we need to do this double, like hedge our bets and try to regenerate planetary health by regenerating bioregional health on the one hand as the pathway through the thin end, like the, the, the eye of the needle. Mm -hmm. and if we're not so lucky, we're still by building community resilience at the bioregional scale, build structures that will, whoever comes after us, more able to weather the consequences of, us, of our actions and life itself being more abundant and more diverse if we take that road now. And so for me, it, it's 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 vital. And I feel like everything you've, you've done with your research, um, touches on on all of that including the, the the bit about ai and and the history and the new governance uh, so please tell me a little bit more about about yourself and about your research because it's fascinating yeah so i guess i'll start a little bit with my background i i have a transdisciplinary education i got a ba in sociology i got a masters in business because i was working for Walmart at the time, and they had rolled out their sustainability goals. And I really wanted to deepen into that understanding of like, what does sustainability mean in business? And then um, I would say after I had my children, it gave me an opportunity to reflect and kind of take some time away from that and really consider, um, you know, I, I, in short, I felt very disillusioned ultimately by that whole process. And I wanted to then take a different type of learning journey into philosophy to really understand, well, I understand that um, our ecosystems are getting ravaged, um, but I didn't understand quite how, how that we got there in the first place. And so I felt like doing a PhD in philosophy would enable me to deepen into some of those questions about like, well, how do we even get here in the first place? How do we get to this place of alienation and disconnection, even disassociation between um, our interbeing, not only with our fellow humans, but with all other species on the planet, in which we're inherently connected. Um, so that's what I've been doing over the last couple of years. And I would say that my what I'm interested in doing my research now is really sort of at the beginning of that journey, because for a few years, I've been sort of getting up to speed on the landscape of philosophy, and now I can really deepen into the research that uh, that I wanted to do when I initially came to my program. So that's kind of where I am at the moment. And what I've landed on is that I want to focus on bioregional governance, mm -hmm. and um, I want to look at you know use a number of tools to kind of help me think about that. Several meta theories that I think can help us deepen into this paradigm of complexity move away from this alienation and, and what I call kind of a paradigm of simplicity. Um, and then also look at some other things that um, were even sort of surprising to me, like looking at anarchy literature 
And, and then of course, what, what's happening on the indigenous front, some black movements, um, as well as past uh, bioregional efforts and current bioregional efforts as well. So there's a lot going on in there and I'll, I'll just let you ask whatever question comes out of that. <laughs> When you say anarchy literature, you mean um, Kropotkin and Bookchin and 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 those kind of um, authors, or, or who who are you referring to? Yes, yes. So Kropotkin, um, LSC Reclu, um, Bookchin certainly, uh, and, and a number of others. That really, I'm just at the beginning of that journey. I would say of taking anarchy seriously. Um, I you think I had to. You <laughs> yeah, go ahead. There's an interesting his, his, historical link to somebody that I have been very inspired by and, and and feel is critical in all of this in terms of bringing this way of thinking into Western thought and planning and, and, and that sphere. Um, Patrick Geddes, who mm. um, worked at Dundee University but lived in Edinburgh and did basically participatory urban renewal in Edinburgh with um, starting the world's first student union and, and, and turning the slums of Edinburgh into what is now the old town of Edinburgh. He um, is also credited for, for having started what is now the Edinburgh International Festival, and it was initially called the Edinburgh International Summer School. And he basically, um, which is radical 120 years ago, in, invented this idea of getting people that he thought were pushing current thought around Europe at the time um, onto a stage to have a conversation. And he actually invited Le Play and, um, and Kropotkin and um, all sorts of uh, uh, Ernst Heckel and all sorts of thinkers um, to contribute to public conversations. And out of his work with the, the, the Valley section and urban planning within the context of its mountains, its river system, and the final aquifer, the connection to the sea. All of that brings in a, a very bioregional um, thought. Uh, right. Yeah, I remember reading a little bit, either watching in your videos or reading in your book, I can't remember, but learning a bit about him. So thank you for that uh, reminder to dig more into that. It's, it's um, and the bit about AI, I'd be interested in how you weave that in all, into all of that. Like, is it with regard to governance or? Uh, um... Well, I think it's a question about technology in general, because it, obviously these are very powerful tools. And I think we'll just sort of reify existing problems into this powerful technology if we don't critically think about it. And um, yeah, AI, I think, has a lot of potential as well as blockchain but um, there's also potentially a lot of pitfalls with that. So I, I don't see those things as sort of a silver bullet. I, I want to bring a very critical perspective to um, how we're looking at that. Because you're, you're also looking at indigenous and, and literature on, on all of this um, or knowledge because it's often not written down. Because I mean, that's that points at exactly my critique for AI is that this growing intelligence that has been fed on everything Western civilization has ever written, made movies about taking pictures of all of that, um, mm -hmm. is being nourished by a very limited worldview of who we are and what we're here for and, and what we've achieved. Mm -hmm. But it is the most prevalent of whatever has been written about, made songs about, music, movies about, and all of that. And so whatever intelligence that would then advise us is based on the knowledge of the most lost generation in human history and therefore possibly not as useful as current unicorns in the Bay Area making it out to be. I, I think you're absolutely correct. And um, yeah, I think we have to proceed very carefully um, with that for sure. And the, the other bit, and that would be interesting because People can come to the bioregional thing for so many regions, uh, reasons. Um, but of course, the other, like one path towards bioregionalism is understanding that local community self reliance or individual self reliance in the prepper way is impossible. Like you, the, the only way of building community resilience in place and enabling other people to do so in other places um, is 
by creating not just a community local ultra local approach but uh, by a regional um, approach of meeting basic needs collectively mm -hmm. and and that's also bringing a lot of people into the bioregion sometimes in a very strange mix of people because it, the ultra right and the ultra left can be <laughs> attracted <laughs> by by a sort of regional story but one of them is what Michael Tomashaw called cosmopolitan bioregionalism, where it's understood that we're all healing places and healing bioregions. And if everybody does that in their region and we support each other to do that, then we can solve global problems. And the other mm -hmm. one is a, is a sort of life bulb um, and so like prepping at the at the regional scale. Uh, yeah. um, right. Have you have you come across that in America, that there's that there are strange political currents within the regional movement that aren't always seeing eye to eye? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've been following a couple of efforts in California. First of all, California in 1991 did map out what they call their bioregions for the state. And that was driven essentially by um, trying to protect species from the Endangered Species Act. And so they realized that, you know, trying to protect one species really doesn't work. You have to think about it within the terms of its habitat and, and it's a much wider area. So that was sort of the impetus for why they created this bioregional map. Um, and then right now I'm following an effort called the California Economic Resilience Fund, which is a regional effort to try to decentralize economic decision-making to the regions in California. Um, it's not a bioregional perspective. It's some of them are close, but I would say there's a um, there's a disconnect there between that historical mapping of the bioregions and how the state is looking at economic development. Mm -hmm. So I feel very hopeful in that California is at least realizing that um, it's a huge state. It's now teetering on being the fourth largest economy in the world. It's very difficult to manage that from a top-down perspective. And with COVID, they realized that the state has, has sort of has two sides of it. There's one side that's very affluent, um, driven by Silicon Valley and um, things like that. And then there's a lot of people who are suffering and in more rural parts of the state. And so this is, I think, a fairly progressive effort to try to come to terms with that. And um, and it's bringing in you know all sorts of people. I think primarily who um, are working with nonprofits to tackle some of these things. But um, I think there's a disconnect between like how do the agencies that are working on conservation and such like connect with these efforts to think about what a resilient, sustainable economy might look like in California. Mm -hmm. So that's just one example. Yeah, no, I mean, this as because this is so complex to refit. Like to on the one hand, accept that there's aspects of our globalized industrial growth society, as Joanna, Joanna Macy called it, um, that are simply too large not to fail in, in a living system. And mm -hmm. that are particularly at this point in, in, in the game with regard to climate change and biodiversity loss and cascading e ecosystems collapse and economic instability and um, the whole way that all of that is driving future food, water, energy crises, and and so on and so forth. Um, we we need to fundamentally redesign how we meet the places that we dwell in, mm -hmm. and at the same time, we need to deal with the existing system. So there are all these structures like. Um, the map behind me is Robert Zook's wonderful map of watersheds around the world. That's mm -hmm. a biophysical map. That's the closest to having a map of bioregions that, that, that to approximate through watersheds um, mm -hmm. that we can get. And even there, you can cl clearly see that some of them, the Mississippi, the Amazon, the, the, the Nile Delta or the, the, the Ganges are probably too large to be one single regions. They like they, the, the whole boundaries of bioregionalism will be also interesting whether you, you you've encountered that dilemma to some extent. But yeah. but I I I think it, like we have that dilemma of how do we define a living, breathing, fractal boundary that that is multi-layered. Um that is like as again, I think it was Michael Thomas who who said that um 
a bioregion is both a biophysical terrain and a terrain of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I love that because it, it really points out that there is something about ancient story, song and identity that, mm -hmm. that we can reconnect when we when we look at real bioregional boundaries that, that are beyond the biophysical. But but anyway, like how do we engage with the UN system and all these administrative levels from national to regional to local? And mm -hmm. um I mean of course engaging local and regional government is probably the first place to start, but then the complexity starts with what you were just alluding to, where you're realizing that just because this is a economic region, it doesn't mean it's a bioregion. Like it might span two or three bioregions, and 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 so it's how to um, not just create a grassroots movement, but create a way of connecting that grassroots movement to existing structures. Is, is going to be a, a real challenge and it'll be different in every place. That's why there yeah, is well, yeah. one size fits all. Let's do a global training for how to do bioregional because it is just going to look different in every place. Uh -huh. Right. I mean, I think, um, well, I think Michael Tomashaw was borrowing the terrain of consciousness from Peter Berg. Okay. Um, he wrote that with uh, Raymond Dasman and uh, re-inhabiting a se separate country. Mm -hmm. But um yeah, I think what you're talking about in terms of first the borders, um, I think of bioregions as having very fuzzy boundaries. I think people can define them in different ways. Peter Berg's conception of a bioregion was that it's not only this kind of biophysical terrain with specific flora or fauna, but there's there is this terrain of consciousness which speaks to um, the human element, the human cultures within those places. And so um that can be a challenge, I think, to our um, conceptions of wanting to know certainty that uh, the fuzzy boundary, boundaries of the bioregion is, is, is just something we're going to have to accept. And, and people can define it in different ways. And I think that's OK. And then in terms of, you know, working with existing structures, I think, um, you know, this is very challenging. Obviously, I, I don't have a lot of confidence personally in the kind of nation state model. Um, it's been about 51 years, I think, since the limits to growth report. And we still don't really have a climate agreement with any teeth and carbon continues to go up. So uh, I, I feel like to sort of break this hegemony of um, thinking, we do need this sort of more bottom up by a regional approach and uh, how that will look like working with existing kind of state structures is something I definitely want to dive into and get um, get into more detail because it's, it's, I think it's, that's going to be the crux of the challenge. Although like having, I'm slightly mentally influenced by the fact that I talked with Helen and Norberg Hodge for an hour and a half yesterday, um, who has been a strong advocate for us not losing the eye on on the ball that even these nation states have been lobbied by supranational structures that are actually corporations into yeah. a structure of um, agreements on tariffs and trades and all of that that what we are meant to believe that there's sovereignty um of at even at the highest level fully in to say we now understood that we need to support bioregional production for bioregional consumption and favor local and regional enterprises over imports. We need to engage in import substitutions. All of those things are illegal. And in any country in the world, if a government went that path, there are corporations that could sue at international laws, uh, uh, court, court, courts of law against that. And, mm -hmm. and so, so that's the other part of that the, there's a there's a structure that is goes beyond the national system that is also not interested in people um coming home to place um, yeah absolutely um I mean it's it's hard I think for many of us to imagine sort of breaking out of capitalism and um, this kind of death grip that it has on the world. And certainly many nation states have sort of been co-opted by corporate structures that become more or less a corporatocracy. Um, 
you know, I, I I guess there's there's movement there with businesses trying to be um, more sustainable. But after spending nearly a decade with Walmart, where I, where I sort of landed was that was that there's no amount of sort of tweaking around the edges that's ever going to be enough. Um, and that's yeah. how do we so how do we get out of that? I, I... <laughs> the wrong thing a little bit better doesn't make it the right thing. Yeah. Uh, right. that's, that's unfortunately there's so many well-meaning in like like really committed people in the sustainability teams of large companies who really want to serve their children and future generations and make a difference and the sooner they realize that that there is a deeper conversation to ask do we want to sustain this living organism that we're currently trying to make sustainable uh, or do we want to transform it, asking a, a kind of deeper question of what is the potential of people and their capacity to be redeployed in local and regional meaningful efforts. And, and that's eventually, I think, because we now live in the age of consequences and have a situation where we need to um, respond to cascading collapse of systems that no longer serve around us. And unfortunately, some cascading collapse of systems that served humanity and life for millions of years. Mm -hmm. um, we we will, like change is changing us. It's no longer a slow process of having to um, convince people, don't you see? Um, it'll be in part an emergency response, in part a survival mechanism, in part um, anticipation and, and community resilience building as we begin to get more and more hits coming our way and we're realizing, okay, we, we, we need to <laughs> change our ways. But but uh, to, to lighten it up a little bit, I, I feel yeah. like I've done a lot of really big ground research uh, recently on the history of bioregionalism. And some people listening and including myself, like I keep, uh, I know a little bit about Raymond Dasman and Peter Berg, and I've been inspired by the Planet Trump Foundation when I first learned about bioregionalism in 2001, 2002, while I was at Schumacher College. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I actually came in through it because Brian Goodwin had been at a meeting with Thomas Berry at the time and came back with this early notion of what he called Earth jurisprudence, mm -hmm. and, um, which then basically turned into what is not now Earth law and nature's rights and and all of that. And, and, um, and it and it just made perfect sense to me. And that's when, when I first learned about um, Planet Drum. And, and then I realized that there was this beautiful um, link through Gary Snyder with the, the kind of um, City Lights bookshop and 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 uh, Kerouac and Dharma Bums and, and all of that. Um, that right. they were somewhat connected around that time. But but you've not only done the research, but also worked with Planet Drum Foundation to to really understand that bit of bioregional history. Um, can you mm -hmm. share that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. So I started volunteering for Planet Drum, I want to say around 2020, so a couple of years now. But um, this year is their 50th anniversary, which is astonishing. It was founded in 1973. And the sort of impetus behind that. Well, first I'll give a little background on Peter, who was coming out of the kind of 60s counter culture. Um, he was in the San Francisco mime troupe who did guerrilla theater, you know, spontaneous acts of theater on the street and things like that. And then um, he was part of a group called the Diggers who um, were bumming around the Haight-Ashbury in the 60s, they had a, a store called the, uh, it's called the free store, but, um, and everything in it was free. And so their thing was that um, do your own thing and then everything is free. So he's sort of coming out of that. He was influenced also by several anarchist thinkers. But in 1972, he went to the UN Stockholm meeting and um, it was there that he noticed all these people in the streets who who really did not have a voice at that meeting, you know, tens of thousands of people. And he started filming them. And then he um, he took he took the video that he made inside the, the meeting um, kind of lobby area and started showing it. And so that was his I, I would say kind of a realization that there's this group that he called the planetariat who 
didn't really have a voice at these UN meetings, but were obviously very concerned about what was happening to the environment um, from all the places they lived all over the world. And so coming back to the US, he and his partner, Judy Goldheft, traveled around the country for a bit and were stopping at these back to the land communities and noticed that everywhere that they went that there was just all kinds of environmental degradation. And they there was a desire to connect these communities. So he started doing video postcards and sharing that with the next community they would go to and began organically to form this network. And then coming back to San Francisco around 1973 is when they decided to found Planet Drum to essentially um, as a communication network to keep these communities in the loop and encourage each other um, and share, you know, insights and, and things that they were doing to try to live a more sustainable existence. So that's initially how it started. And then since that time, they've had a number of publications. They have used to have a publication called Raise the Stakes mm -hmm. and now a smaller one called The Pulse, but they've also put out several books. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you know when, when because that's interesting, um, that like I I know some of the, like like Albert Bates is a friend of mine who um, lived and was part of the farm um, for, for many years. So I'm, I'm assuming that that's one of those communities. But do you know when they, because Planet Drum had, had a clear bioregional focus, but you, the way you just told, told Peter's story, that it was inspired by some sort of intentional communities where people were kind of living at the, at the ultra local scale, a, a sort of building an alternative model kind of um, pathway, which is akin to the, the eco-village movement as well. And um, when did they move from that to having the regional focus? Yeah, so I, I don't know exactly to answer your question, but I know that Peter was inspired by reading um, Murray Bookchin's work. And then uh, at some point he connected with Raymond Dasman, who I think was talking about eco-regions and Peter wanted to bring the human cultural component to that idea. And so they connected and that became a very fruitful uh, relationship. So that article, uh, Re-Inhabiting a Separate Country, was written in 1978. So I would say sometime, um, sometime between 1970 and 1978 is when when that happened. Okay, yeah. So also, it, somehow there must be overlaps with with um, John and Nancy Todd and Donna Klani starting the New Alchemy Institute also initially in on the West Coast and then moving it over um, to the East Coast um, shortly mm. I mean, it's because they were involved in, in the Stockholm conference and um, it was just a very small group of people back then. Do you, have you started to look m more into um, Kropotkin and the kind of Russian anarchist by regional mutual aid? Um, do you, maybe like what, what, what have yeah. you learned about them so far? Yeah. So, I mean, I said earlier that really I'm, I'm at the beginning of my journey with really taking anarchy seriously. And it's been... Um, it's been an exciting, I think, discovery for me, but Kropotkin's mutual aid, I've only looked at a little bit, but certainly he's on my list to really dive into. That's that's really sort of my next phase with this research is that I'm gonna dive deeply into the anarchist literature in a more systematic way, but I haven't really begun to, to do that yet. And I mean, as a, at a more general level, like on the one hand, there is such wealth in this research, in the literature, in the different fields, and but it is the academic pursuit of a doctor in philosophy, um, and and then there is this real vibrant um, new impulse that is is alive on the planet right now, where people want to like where they're rediscovering. Um, coming home to place, re-inhabitation, um, bioregional context of meaning, of provisioning, of um, relating, um, of restoring ecosystems and 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 identity and and social cohesion. Um, more and more organizations are popping up that are helping this process. And mm -hmm. um, how are you in your research? making that bridge because I think that like at this time it will be so exciting to bridge between both the the history of um but it, also the practice of now um have you, right yeah. yeah absolutely I want to bring in the historical component but then also look at 
current efforts. Um, I used to follow Joe Brewer a little bit more closely than I do now. So I would say, you know, what he's working on as part of that. Um, the 2030 Amazon Sacred Headwaters Bioregional Plan, I think is kind of an exciting development that's bringing in um, the social aspect of indigenous sovereignty, as well as obviously the ecological component of protecting that very valuable and um, necessary ecosystem for life on this planet. Um, and then I wanna look at other movements that aren't necessarily bioregional. Um, for example, in Jackson, Mississippi, there's something called Cooperation Jackson, Jackson where um, a lot of Black individuals are getting together and trying to work on citizen assemblies and things like that. So I think I think all these different things can add um, a, a, a component to um, enriching kind of what a theory of bioregional governance might look like. And I think that will look different in every place. And um, what I hope to deliver would be um, sort of like a, not prescribing any certain sort of way, but kind of a menu of ways to think about this and, and how those different governance structures might be able to work with existing um, power structures. I mean, governance is such a massive term. And now um, there's so many geeky techie people working in crypto and um, blockchain and holochain and and you name it um, mm -hmm. in in DAOs um, like decentralized autonomous organizations that that are all passionately believing that what they're designing is the new support system for full transparency governance um, and yeah. and contracting um, agreement making sounds mm -hmm. uh, super uh -huh. and <laughs> like I keep seeing a lot of potential blind spots there and, and pitfalls that um, like for example with governance like I've lived in a small analog example the failure of the consensus approach in, in intentional communities mm -hmm. because consensus doesn't work um, the kind of structures that then were were later developed and 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 formalized into sociocracy and holacracy evolved, where where you basically create subgroups that are closer to issues in certain areas, and they make like not everybody needs to make all, all the decisions, and 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 right. and the kind of interlinking of different circles and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. But when it gets to this idea that just because we can keep a perfect record on it's all super transparent, um, everybody can now vote on everything. If that is combined with a culture that is so deeply manipulated by social media and and canceling culture and opinion and and following um, the opinion of others, then like it's actually dangerous to have everybody vote on everything because mm -hmm. that. Like when it's about whatever the corrosion rate of an average um, urban water pipe, I'd rather have a civil engineer who has studied water pipes um, decide how how often we should check that tube than somebody who's oh well that doesn't seem so important and uh, whatever I mean part passive large of course but but I like how. I, how have you have you started to think about that? Like the 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 pitfalls of full transparency, everybody's got to vote on everything, which which in initially sounds really egalitarian and how great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think everybody voting on everything is just infeasible. I think there's already such an overwhelming amount of information that most people don't even have the headspace to begin to try to deal with issues they may or may not be interested in, um, but especially ones that they know nothing about. Um, so I think that's a really great question. And I don't have a great answer for you, I'd say, but um, yeah, I think uh, the bioregional congresses, at least the first four was facilitated by this woman named Carolyn Estes, who used a consensus process to sort of come up with these resolutions. And um, 
it was a very exhausting process, I think, for, for everyone involved. And so what you were saying about sociocracy and having these circles of people to make decisions, you know, maybe, maybe there are a couple of things that everyone needs to vote on, but probably those decisions could be made within a circle of people to, um, that are the right people to make those decisions, but how to get the right people into that circle to make the decisions um, is tricky also. Um, one, one blockchain example is from the Region Foundation. They're working on something called a community staking DAO. Mm -hmm. And so one of the one of the issues with kind of blockchains and crypto is that it's it's usually like a one token sort of one vote system. And that can bring in um, a, a, that brings in a lot of problems that are just, just like migrating over from our current system. So the people who have the techno, techno, technological wherewithal to sort of stick with it and understand this process, the people who can afford to participate in this, right? You're, you're sort of biasing toward that. But the Region Foundation has recognized this and they've tried to come up with something they call the community staking model where even though people may not have um, you know, tokens, they should still be somehow involved in the decision making because what's happening in, in that region is affecting them. And so I think they are still working on how to get there. Um, and I think it's it's a very tricky question and a great question that you're asking. And um, I don't know that I've seen currently any any models that that are doing a fantastic job about that, I guess. But I, th I think it's also because we still need to think what would these governance systems actually all have to deal with, and 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 like to some extent, I, like friends of mine are now working. They, they, they did a lot of work in in in, in Berlin and Germany, um, creating sort of accelerator programs for startups in the tech space and and all that kind of stuff, and then they thought they could do some similar things in Africa trying to help startups and they realized that with so many like even kind of ecological and social um, benefit projects you have to invent a whole ecosystem and I think that the danger of inventing governance systems without thinking about the user cases uh, mm -hmm. um, is is actually that that's where you can can lose the the the, the ground connection uh, mm -hmm. Like, for example, there are other people who are working on not quite the governance, but the the organizational forms that need to exist to support bioregional regeneration. So, like, I know of a guy, Tom, uh, Thomas Hahn in Germany, who, um, in the very complicated German juridic system where you to, to register a new form of, of um, cooperative Genossenschaft, he he's now registered a regenerative cooperative that that doesn't have econo just economic benefit but the regeneration of the bioregion as the core um, raison d'être and the reason why mm -hmm. members join it and and these kind of mechanisms like imagine if in every bioregion all ecological farmers all rewilders all um, every little property that of people that that care about the region and its integrity would join a cooperative in which they become members and build a larger body of also value because if people mm -hmm. put their value into this cooperative like this this happened when when the spanish banking system was was kicking people out of their flats um in in 2010 2011 2012 when the economic crisis of 2008 started to hit in Spain. And mm -hmm. in Catalonia, they built a the um, Cooperativa Integral Catalana, in which they invited everybody, private people that were losing their flat and small businesses that were losing their small business to say, well, you can either lose it or you join us. And then they collected collectively created a bad debt so big that the bank couldn't just cancel it and kick them out. Mm. And so they, they actually protected everybody's personal little flat or business and, and so on by coming together and creating um, a cooperative infrastructure. So, so the, the reason why I'm telling this vignette 
is I think that regional development cooperatives in their different forms as they match bioregional situations and, and legal systems and so on. And the same intergenerational land trusts, like the, the minute you in a region create a legal mechanism by which land can be taken out of the circle of speculation and dedicated to a regenerative purpose. And then there's an oversight committee that looks at who works this land in perpetuity or even with the right to um, pass on to the next generation, but with a key set of regenerative principles behind it. And, and it's like, I think these that'd be really interesting um, since you're still at the early point of your, your research to look at how the theory and the story connect with with um, like these these other like governance and organizational structures, I, I think come hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I love that. Um, I, I think it's kind of similar to a DAO, I think, and it's kind of most ideal form is that it's a new type of organization where people could theoretically come together and um, cooperate on whatever they find meaningful and what they attempt what they're attempting to do. Um, so I love that. I'll uh, I'll add that to my list of considerations for sure. No, I mean that it's interesting because the the DAO. I have I had this recently. I had. Um, Ronnie Patel um, come and come and visit after I met him in at a conference in Ibiza, the, the neighboring island, and he's one of the um, kind of core creators of both the, the seeds currency, um, but mainly is focused on on the creation of the Haifa DAO and and this sort of offer of making it easy for people to create DAOs. And so I'm trying to get my head around. Um, the DAO conversation. And I, the reason why I'm interested in these structures is that they're, that they're actually analog structures in place, in a, embedded in an economy, because once you have a cooperative, you're not a foundation anymore, an association trying to do some good in that space, but you're mm -hmm. an active economic player. And then the, you, you have much more leverage in the system through that. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the DAO has the danger to my mind that, that it's by decentralized meaning people from all over the place can can be part of a DAO then it, it has that our attention yet again into the digital space rather than the analog human relationship sp space and I think it's dangerous to build systems at this point that rely on the persistent provision of energy and materials that are needed to to have this ubiquitous use of technology um mm -hmm. i mean that's that's the what i was going to ask you earlier to what extent in the bioregional approach like when i was going off on the tangent with the, the prepping at the regional scale um what, what i actually wanted to ask is um the two facts that i find really interesting that that um, i've learned through nate hagen's work um the the Institute for the Study of Energy and the Future of Humanity or something like that is what, what he runs. And he finished a PhD in 2019 or 2020 that had him focus on the global energy system. And, and so this is some, like most of his data has the data point 2018 um, when he must have done all this research. Um, so he says that in 2018, there was we were using 17 terawatts a second that's mm. 17 trillion 100 watt light bulbs 17 mm. trillion uh, running every second on the planet in terms of energy yeah. to drive a civilization of which only 5 to 10 to 15 maximum percent really benefit from this ridiculous use of energy right and at the same time we've created a material culture that puts through per second or per year or whatever you want to put as a measure um, about a thousand times as much material as a hundred years ago. Mm. And then we have all these conversations about how we're going to build the future and our mental building blocks, including AI and technologies like all of that, 
assume that all of this is just available because you just plug in a computer yeah, and <laughs> it runs, doesn't it? Yeah, and then like almost fully developed parts of the world like Cape Town and has roving power cuts already that don't run the city's system 24 seven anymore. Those are the futures we were moving into, that where people live in gated communities and the batteries of the alarm systems only last for two hours, but the power cuts are five hours. Mm -hmm. uh, and we need human relationships. We don't need more technology to protect ourselves from one another or to help us make agreements. Like if you if you have human relationships, if you have structures that that work, um, because they're grown out of a place through a collective process of re-inhabitation and mm -hmm. understanding that we need to build community resilience in order to be able to weather disruption. I think that's that's where, where I feel the, the, the bioregional story really begins to to just not just be an academic interest, but but really a path for um yeah, for re-inhabiting the earth. Like I, they, they, well, in your research, like the the first Peter Berg wrote an essay called "Re-inhabitation." That was the first way it was that that word was coined. Or do, do you do you remember? Yeah, he wrote it in um he wrote it initially in an article that was in a more obscure publication, but then he refined that article. It was called "Re-inhabiting a Separate Country." Um, with Raymond in around 1978 that, um, yeah, so that's, that's, I would say, um, how, how it began to get traction was from that article. Um, but yeah, what you're saying about the energy, I, I completely agree. I, you know, I think renewable energy uh, requires a mining infrastructure, even to make solar panels requires, you know, fossil fuels to get that to a high enough temperature to to create the panels. Um, so, you know, what you're saying about more human scale, I think absolutely that's that's probably where we're, we're, we're headed. Um, how long that takes, right, is, is one thing. And I think people want to hold on to the, the dream of maybe a slow transition, but the reality is that these kind of storms and um, crazy. I just saw an article pop up that July now is going to be the hottest month on record. Um, you know, so I think um, until maybe it gets a little bit worse, then people will start taking that more seriously. But um, until then, I think the sort of renewable energy dream continues on. Mm, yeah, and it and again, but the danger is that we that we're so trained in either or thinking that. Once we discover the critique of mining and 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 not being able to ubiquitously deploy neither renewables nor electric cars nor any of these promising technologies, that that it like there's a subtext buy-in to saying I'm okay with living in an obscenely unequal world and having access to all of these while others don't, mm -hmm. um, and these technologies if we collectively wisely say if in 20 years time we only have a fifth of the energy and a, and a tenth of the materials to use every second as a global civilization how would we deploy that energy and that material use meaningfully in a way to support bioregional populations to re-inhabit their bioregions their ecosystems their cities and their history and place mm -hmm in a way that is peaceful and meets their basic needs and still enable them to learn, share, be human in relationship to other peoples in other places that do the same thing. That's mm -hmm. the vision. That's that's like, like one thing that if we want to survive as a species, we want, don't want to lose is the ability to be global in our awareness and collaboration and thinking and learning and exchange of ideas. And mm -hmm. But if we think that we need to store like huge amounts of cat and mouse videos and um, Netflix Hollywood productions and telenovelas from the 1970s, 
at some point we will have to choose what to delete of all this stuff <laughs> and 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 how how to wisely manage technology use um i think i don't know it's it's a massive conversation and most people just think when you bring those things up you're nuts because particularly in your part of the world in the bay area and <laughs> it's a minority yeah. perspective <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you're bringing up excellent points. I, I think about these things uh, all the time. So um, we're going to be wrestling with this. And I think doing that within the bioregions, like figuring out how how we can have appropriate technology that's more suited to a lifestyle that's compatible with living with other species on this planet, you know, that's, that's a huge thing to figure out. And um, we're on that journey. And I think each region will, it'll look different ultimately, I think in each region. Is there growing energy like um, from, for example, the Buckminster Fuller Institute now um, running programs and focusing on bioregional work um, more since um, Stuart Cohen moved in there. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, I know that James Quilligan did with the Global Commons Alliance or something, they did, did a watershed report of San Francisco at some point, not so long ago. Um, mm -hmm. is, is there some kind of citizen-led or alliance-led between different organization process beginning where these different initiatives at least say, hey, guys, we have all this value we created and we have all this shared perspective. Um, shall we have conversations around what could happen in the Bay Area, or is that hasn't it gelled yet to that point? I, I'm not seeing that at this point. I mean, I might just not be aware of it. Mm -hmm. I have looked at Quilligan's report uh, on kind of the sustainability of the the Bay Area being able to sustain itself. Certainly, the city and county of San Francisco could not sustain itself um, with its very small footprint. But if you extend that out to the larger Bayer region, I, I think. I think a study revealed that you, it, the population could be supported at around nine or 10 million, which sounds like a lot to me. It's it's currently at about eight. So mm -hmm. um, nearing maximum capacity on that. Mm. Yeah, but yeah. even I have like, because that's such a vital study that we don't have for Mallorca yet. And like, what is the carrying capacity of an island the size of Mallorca and how many tourists can it actually cope with um, in addition to that? And and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the infrastructure load that that, that generates uh, but yeah it's it, it's a massive moving field but it's just so exciting to be able to do academic research in, in into that field so who who is your supervisor sean kelly ah lovely uh, coming home yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly i mean that notion of coming home um it's not just coming home to earth as as a cosmic species but coming home into uh, that it would also explain your your um in route through to complexity through complex thinking in Edgar now that's it all right yeah. mm -hmm. that's, that's also uh, like i i've not really read much at Gamora, but every time I, I read any of him i kind of have the sense of mustn't get lost here because if i take this detour i'll i'll surface a year and a half later and i'll sound like sean kelly <laughs> Yes. Um, you know, I mean, all of the theorists that I mentioned earlier spent about 30 years working on on their efforts. So it's uh, a vast amount of information to sort through, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I one example, because you work at CIS, like um, Richard Tannis writing the West, The Passion of the Western Mind, which in and of itself is a mammoth work of scholarship that that can't be surpassed to my mind. It's it's a brilliant book. And it took me years to realize that that was him just getting warmed up and doing the background research for Cosmos and Psyche. Uh, and right. it, it's that kind of long range academic pursuit where I say, okay, hats off, like um, <laughs> might not be right. as academic as that but but it's 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 powerful that the uh, and the same yeah it took him 10 years to write the passion of the western mind and and probably the as cosmos a, psyche maybe just as long i don't i don't recall on that one and and is brian goodwin still involved with cis is he still teaching um uh, brian swim brian, oh, brian swim uh, brian swim of course uh, he's officially retiring this year 
Mm -hmm. uh, his new book just came out, Cosmogenesis, mm -hmm. which is uh, a great read, more of his kind of personal story and his journey uh, along the way, which certainly has some laugh out loud moments, but um yeah, I, I love yeah. Peter and, and, and like I, I had the good, good fortune of hosting all these folks um, while I was running Finthorn College. They all had heard of Finthorn for decades, but none had, none of them had ever been invited by Finthorn because Finthorn was always busy. And, and I thought, oh, I'm I'm at the Finthorn College, I can invite them all, and they were all super excited and came. And um, yeah, if you meet Brian, ask him about Macbeth's castle, um, okay. because we we had lunch with. Lady Angelica Cordo, who's the lady of the manor of Cordo Castle, where the Thane of Cordo, Macbeth, actually lived. And 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 Brian being American and his wife I just couldn't believe that it would ever um have that experience of, of <laughs> sitting around the castle dining table um, of Macbeth's castle. So wow. if you if you prod him with that, he'll tell you the story, no, no doubt. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> right. And, and maybe the last thing to, to sort of mention for, because if we do decide to share this as, as voices of the regeneration, is, are you, are you up for that? Shall we, shall we put it out? Um, I mean, sure. Yeah. If you think it's, um, if yeah. you think it's good enough, I guess. No, also because it's, it, you might, in, people might just want to connect with your research somehow and, and might, might be useful. Um, mm -hmm. the, um where was I going? Uh, lost my train of thought. Ah, yeah, the the work that you've been doing, helping Planet Drum Foundation to <coughs> kind of get the new website or the the rehashing of the website up, and also the the celebrations to the fiftieth anniversary of uh, Planet Drum. Um, how how can people find out more? What can they find on the website? And 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 what are the sort of webinars and the the celebrations that are coming up? Sure. So people can visit planetdrum.org to see the new website. And just to clarify, I did not I did not build the new website. I only worked on the tributes, which I ended up getting uh, over 40 people to write in about Planet Drum, which is lovely. So if you go to planetdrum.org, there's a little tab that says Planet Drum at 50. Mm -hmm. And there you can click to see what the events are, as well as to see the tributes. But some of the events, just to name um, several, are there's going to be... Uh, a panel discussion and interaction with, with the audience at the main public library in San Francisco on October 14th. Mm -hmm. There's going to be uh, on September 23rd, a co-celebration with Shaping SF to celebrate Planet Drum's Frisco Bay Muscle Group, which was kind of a research um, group that worked on understanding the Bay Area bioregion more. And I would say their biggest contribution is that they blocked the periphery canal project, which was trying to divert water from the Delta down to Southern California. Um, so that's on September 23rd. And then there'll be a culmination party on October 22nd at the new farm NSF. And there will be one celebration in, in Paris on December 9th and 10th for anyone who's international. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how widely that will be open at this point but mm -hmm. that's in the planning stages right now okay paris that was always an excuse to travel with my <laughs> wife and my daughter to paris um I, um yeah no that's lo lovely because in in the i mean the new website is is no massively new website it's a lot better than the old website oh, it's a, it's it's a vast improvement and uh judy has been working hard on that for for a long time and she's put many many resources on there so there's also a resource tab if you go to that website and you can see uh, many of uh, peter's writing as, as well as their publications and all sorts of videos and it's just a wonderful it's it's really like I'm so glad that she did that because many of their publications um, were never online before they were only in print, and so now more people I think can find out about it and really be inspired. Yeah, it's a it's it's a treasure trove. Like I just sort of started digging into it, and it's yet one of those things that being busy what what I doing what I'm doing, uh, it ends up on a shelf for a while until I actually can go as deep as I would like to. But it's like from the videos to the articles, like wh what a gift to to have that um, opportunity to to see that this is not new thinking, that this mm -hmm. is that people 50 years ago rediscovered core wisdom about how humanity can live in, live in right relationship 
and and build a movement around it that that didn't catch on back then but but could catch on now um mm -hmm. and i think it's such a service to have planet drum on the map there they, they, have you have you talked with david hankey um about you oh work? yes yeah I love yes I, i'm glad you mentioned him david and i have talked for hours and hours and oh. uh, he's been such a uh, a wonderful human to get to know um and and i just want to say for your audience that planet drum kind of gave um sort of popularized the idea of the bioregion but david hankey simultaneously was was thinking about organizing in that way um, in the Ozarks. And so it's interesting that these two thinkers were sort of coming to this idea at the same time. But then also this idea is really not new. This is um, sort of based on indigenous knowledge, right? This is how humans used to live closely with the land. And so it's not new in that sense, but I find it interesting that both Peter and David were coming to this realization at the same time on opposite sides of the U.S., yeah, and, and when when they organized the first um, North American Bioregional Congress, I mean, Vinona Laduc was part of that, and there was a key under like shared understanding that they were rediscovering um, how to live bioregionally, not not kind of coming up with a new. I mean, I think this is the the, the big thing that that people need to get also when they talk about regeneration. It, the people jump into this thing it's the new kid on the block oh you're still doing sustainability i already do a regeneration blah it, that kind of framing sets things up for failure mm -hmm. you, to ground them in living history and understand that the bioregional pattern just as much as life's regenerative impulse are patterns that are core to life's processes they're the biophysical reality of living e veins of a living planet giving life giving water to plant biomass that gives life to mammals that make some form of human emerge as expressions of that bioregion and absolutely that's how we fit in and if we don't relearn that we we have no future like there is no ai way of cleverly circumnavigating that need to fit in and mm -hmm. and i find it so amazing that david hankey and, and and these guys really for the north american for the western culture gave voice to i think Geddes did to some extent i think ian mchark with design for nature and his planning approach inspired that there, there, there's a link with all of them through earth day and and this pbs um uh, program the house we live in where ian mchark interviewed lots of really interesting people that that mm. really started the impulse to the first environmental awareness movement in the in the 1960s uh, mm. all of this is 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 interrelated but and and it is just a western rediscovery of indigenous understanding everywhere um and in the minute <clears throat> we understand that that life is fundamentally regenerative and that our species history has to has been keynote keystone species regenerative expressions of place not owners of place gardening ecosystems into higher levels of abundance mm -hmm. and because the minute we own that history we own that we're not a cancer to the planet but we potentially able to undo the damage we have done through a mistaken story of thinking we're masters and separate from nature and absolutely and so yeah i i, I just love that 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 you because it's so important to make people more aware of bioregionalism and there's and and not many people do scholarship on it uh, bring the the wealth of wisdom that is already there in the past into mm -hmm. the context and and that's that's why my my encouragement is, is just really build relationship with all these different bioregional networks that are out there and offer your research as a kind of two-way flow. It'll mm -hmm. create a much more interesting PhD and also you will connect to a network through that process that you don't fall into, which is the big PhD trap, that you mm -hmm. go so deep into your research 
that you need two or three years to actually become human again afterwards, <laughs> speaking from experience. <laughs> so, so watch out for that one. Um, but Thank really, lo really lovely to, to talk to you about your PhD and your work in, in Planet Drum and, and Bioregionals. This was, this was, I learned a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Appreciate you. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye.